All right, we're going to get started here. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about decoy placement, uh, scouting, and, you know, just basic hunting. Probably the one of the best things you could ever do just to, to even start thinking about decoy placement is go out and scout. Watch the birds. Watch how they, they look in the field. You know, feed, you know, feeding birds versus birds just walking around. Uh, you know, just basically posture. You know, kind of just watch them from day to day and see what they look like. You know, see what they look like in the field and then that gives you an idea of, of what you want to look at when you put your decoys out. Um, you know, weather affects it. You know, the amount of food in the field. When you're scouting, if birds are moving slow through the field, really feeding, you know, moving real slow, you know, look like they're really relaxed and, and feeding, that's a field you probably want to come back and hunt the next day. You know, if you see them in the afternoon feeding and they're just moving slow, that's that's a field you want to go back to. But on the other hand, if you see a field and the geese are really moving fast through it and they're hopping over each other and trying to get to food, that field doesn't have much food in it. So they're really searching, they're really moving through the field. So there's not much food, so that's probably not somewhere that you want to try to go back and set up. Even though the geese are there in the afternoon, there's not that much food, so they're probably not going to be back. You want to look for a field where the geese are almost still. You know, they're not moving a whole lot. They're just, you can just see them out, out feeding. And uh, just as an example, um, you know, most of the time you want to set up your decoys, you know, with the wind where they're coming into your face, wind's coming over your back. If you've got sun, that's even better. If you haven't set up and the sun's at your back, that's perfect. Because that way the sun's in their eyes coming in. And all, the, all they can hear the calling and they can see flashes of the decoys. But it's not, you know, it's like us driving in the sun. We can't always see very well. And it's just, just for them, it's like shining a flashlight in their eyes while they're coming in. So that's probably the best time, I mean, that's probably the best situation you can have. If you've got a good wind in the morning where you can set up with the sun at your back, it's unbelievable. Um, you know, we, motion is a big thing uh, with me. I, I just think it just adds so much to it. You can see how these decoys are moving here. Uh, those are brand new. It's a new motion system. And what it is, you see that that little arm coming out there. There's actually a funnel shape in here with a little window cut out of it. So the decoy can only move that far. That's as far as it can move. So it's not going to sit there and just spin. And, you know, the best situation is, is set it facing in the wind. That way it doesn't get pinned to one side. You know, that way it'll be bouncing back and forth. Because if you set it and that's the wind's blowing this way and you, that's the way you set it, it's going to stay like that most of the time. If you turn it this way, that, that decoy is going to get pinned a lot of times. But motion is huge. You know, even for the older decoys that we have, you know, something like this, we make what's called a universal motion stake. And you actually take this base off. You actually take this base off and you have to find the balance point. Just kind of look around and see if you see one. But it's, this is it. You take a, uh, a drill bit, and it's just a quarter inch drill bit, and you find the balance point, and you just set it, you know, you have to drill through, and then that little point just sticks through there. So you've got a motion motion system on a regular full body with the with the feet. So that's just another way to get motion. And, uh, you know, that, that could be the difference. You know, it, the geese are getting smarter and smarter, so the more you can make it look real, the, the static, the old static decoy is going to be a thing of the past. Uh, the geese are just getting so smart, you've got to do everything you can to fool them. And, the, and motion is the biggest thing I think you can do to help yourself out. You know, with these, it's just, it's easy to set them out. And it's, it's actually a lot quicker than this, but... Yes. That's the long. That's the long one. They also have a shorter one. But the, the longer one's the way to go. Especially down here, if you want to go to the water. Yeah. 
Right. Try that with shallow water. Shallow water, yeah. You know, you've got deeper water, just get a longer shaft, get them right up out of the water. Well, you you have to kind of watch putting decoys in too deep of water because birds have been there before and they know they can't stand up in there. You know, if you're out there, you don't want to put decoys standing and in, in it's five feet. You know, you're up to your here and your waders. Birds can't stand out there and they know it. So that's just one thing you have to watch. But this is a great way to take the older style decoy and add some motion to it. Shells yeah, shells work awesome on this. You use the shells on those? Yes. Shell decoys will work. Yeah, the thing of it is, though, remember to what head style goes on that body. Exactly. You need, you need to mark them. You need to mark, like, say, we got a you know, sleeper or you know, like a rester and a, you know, an upright. With different balance points. Because the neck may be, you know, the neck's going to be longer, it'll be balanced a little different. So you need to make sure that when you drill these, yeah that you keep the same heads with the same body. That way you don't get a mix up and you get out there and this decoy is sitting like this all the time. But um, one thing you kind of see here, this this is actually kind of set up, you know, the wind's blowing this, you know, it's not right. You want to be, well actually it is now, coming here. You know, what you'll do, you kind of see these upright birds back here. I use a lot of feeders. I, I use you know, if I put out, let's say if I put out four dozen full body geese, I'm probably going to have three dozen feeders out of that. Because you want your decoys to look as relaxed as possible. If you get a lot of birds head up, those birds are really alert and they're kind of cautious. So you want it to look really relaxed. So, you know, like I say, more feeders, that's, that's what I use. And that's, you talk to most people that, that hunt a lot of geese, and it's a lot more feeders than anything else. Uh, you know, this style, like that high head style, that's a great decoy to use in certain situations, uh, especially high stubble. Just for visibility purposes, it's great. Uh, you really have to watch where you put that bird because that's a dominant bird right there. You really, I mean, that's, if you look at a regular sized goose, which this is just slightly larger than than standard, than life size, but this is a dominant posture right here. So geese don't want to really go close to that bird. That bird's up looking, he's really cautious, checking things out. One thing I use this for, let's say, you know, you've got your, your hole open right here in front of you, and birds keep wanting to slide to your left. You know, the wind's perfect, but birds are just sliding you. I'll take this decoy, set it just like this on the edge of that spread, looking right into the direction they're sliding. Birds don't land face to face. They're going to land behind that bird. So if anything, if not, they're going to slide this way, see that bird, and slide back a little bit, or they'll go around and come in behind that bird, but they're not going to land face to face. You don't see birds coming in landing like this. They're always coming in this way. So, you know, your feeders, here in the middle of the spread, geese will come in this way. If the wind, you know, if they come in this, you know, you want them to come in here, so you don't want everything. Feeders are a little different, but still birds usually won't land. They won't land here. They'll land to the side, land to the back. These decoys back here are what I call walkers. Birds that have landed behind the feeders walking in. So sometimes you'll see you know, you always see that. You'll see birds walking in to where the birds are feeding, and then they'll start feeding right in with these. But let's say, uh, let's say this is just your basic spread here. You know, I'll, I'll set the blinds back in this area. You know, you see it's kind of an open hole right here. I'll set blinds back here and Side, kind of set decoys around it to hide it a little bit more, but you still want to camouflage it down to uh, to help hide the blind. And then, like I said, everything is relaxed as you can. <coughs> and full bodies aren't always the best thing. You know, I'm, it's a great decoy, but cold weather situations, you have to look at warm weather versus cold weather. Uh, Warm weather, the geese are going to be farther apart. Cold weather, you start seeing geese bunch up. 
just just because of heat. Um, same thing in with shells. The best time for shells, snow and ice. You don't see a whole lot of birds walking around in snow. You see a lot of birds in fields resting. A lot of sleepers. Um, I kind of wish I had a sleeper here. Shell. It's pretty, pretty uh, nice looking. Yeah, it's it's sharp. Uh, and if you've ever seen a big bunch of geese sitting in snow, there's a whole lot of sleepers, a whole bunch. And you know there might be two or three birds with their head up, and you know, but you'll see a lot of geese with uh, this kind of posture. You'll see some of these, and actually. You can't really see it on this because it's not the head, but what happens when geese start resting? See how flat that is on the top? When geese start resting, that bill will drop. It'll drop this way, and it causes this goose to have a little point. There's one right there. See how that's got, got that little crown right there? That's a resting bird. You can see how it's painted. You can kind of, that's painted for like an eyelid right there. As that bill starts to drop, this crown comes up, and that's a, that's a basically a sleeper, but he's not turned with his head tucked under his wing. That's just some little small details that help out. Um, then uh, snows and specks are, you know, specks decoy pretty well, uh, respond to calls, much like Canada's do. And they're pretty easy to decoy. Snows, it's just a guessing game with them. But you, I can't stress enough how important scouting is. I know guys that have scouted fields and gone out and put one decoy out and hunted over one decoy. Because there wasn't a lot of birds in the area. Birds were really pressured small decoy spread you have that's you just kind of have to start looking what what are the birds doing you know when birds are really migrating if you're not on the what we call the X where birds want to be you need to and you're trying to call trafficking birds you need a bigger spread but later in the season birds get tough they get call shy they get decoy shy small you can make your spread a little smaller it may be six geese it may be six decoys it may be three it may be a dozen but that just try to separate yourself from you know the guy over here that's got a thousand decoys out that's a the number one thing i see from from what i've talked to people out here in california is these rice fields um and this is kind of going on some ducks but you see these people hunting in the rice fields and they put out the decoys around their pit they put 500 on this side of the check they put 500 on this side of the check and they hunt them the same way all season. Birds recognize that. If you're, especially if it's birds you, you know that are in the area, local birds that see that day in and day out. That's where you need to separate yourself. Uh, there's a lot of good, you know, layout type blinds. We make three blinds. Uh, Goose View makes blinds. Final Approach makes blinds. Everybody, it, and I'm not saying one's better than the other, but utilize that. Separate yourself from them. Go down as far down at the end of the check as you can get. Take one of those layout blinds, camouflage it up on the check, put out six decoys, put out a dozen. I guarantee you it'll make a difference. Just It's something different. Those birds, you know, it's six birds down here just loafing away from the big group. That's more of a relaxed situation. So anything you can do helps. What? Yeah, you know, anything. But um, one thing, too, with hunting geese, you know, I was talk just talked about the layout blinds. Dry field hunting, that's unbelievable. Uh, that's the best way I've seen to ever hunt. You know, those permanent pits, those are great. But to be mobile, as hard as hunting is getting now, the birds are getting smarter, everything's changed. You got to be mobile. You got to be able to move. If you've got the land area to do it, and you can hunt these birds in dry fields, those layout blinds are there's there's no better way to hunt them. 
they're easy to hide, they're lightweight. And one thing you really, you know, I've got some out front. Um, camo is very important now. Whether, you know, shadow grass, Max 4, whatever, uh, whatever you prefer is up to you. But make sure you match your camo with what's around you. You don't want to stand out in, you know, if you're in Thule's, you don't want to be over there in, in something dark black. Yeah, you don't want to be in a, a hardwood camo that doesn't match because you stick out like a sore thumb. You want to match your camo. You want to hide your blind. And there's, there's ways you can do that. One is mudding the blind. And when I say that, all you're doing is basically mixing up, you know, like a, a bucket. Mix it up to the, the consistency of almost like glue of mud and water. You know, and I've used a broom to put it on with. I've mixed it a lot thicker than that and just gloves in your hand and just rub it on there. And all you're doing is taking the shine off of that new blind. And that's where I say camo. It, by the time you do that, sometimes camo is not, not as important on the blind because you can't see it anyway. But clothing is important. Hiding is important. And those blinds are the way to hide. Mud them up. Match the stubble that you're putting in the blinds with what kind of field you're in. You know, you want to get it as, as close to that as you can. I'm not saying you have to completely cover it, but when you start sticking that stubble in there, you can tell when it's hidden and when it's not. When you start seeing a lot of bare spots in it, you need to put more. And the rule of thumb I usually use, if I think I've got enough, put more. Because the better you can hide, the better your success will be. Greenfield, you want to be, you want to be as low as you can. Um, I've I've heard of people using garland from Christmas trees. I've heard of people using, you know, basically using. We make a product called Killer Weed. We've got solid green packs using that. Um, anything, you know, spray painting it, matching it to the color of the field you're hunting. You know, anything you can do, but you definitely, like these sod farms you see out here and, you know, winter wheat. Winter wheat is kind of an unusual situation, uh, especially depending on what time of year you're hunting it. It may just be green strips and not filled in yet. Uh, the best thing I saw for that is uh, we make what's called a field khaki, which is just a brown blind. You know, it's a brown uh, color. You know, it's similar to like this shirt I have on, but it's darker than this. Um, they actually set that crossways across the rows. You could see the rows in the field. You know, it was only up that high, and you know, the rows were this far apart. They set it across the rows like this. The rows are running this way. Across the rows this way, and just put green across the top to match where the rows were going across. Just, just little things like that. Just attention to detail is where you're going to make the, the difference. Yeah. Yeah. It's if you can do that. That's awesome, but a lot of farmers aren't going to let you dig in their field. But, I mean, if, if you could take that much profile off your blind, that's a big difference because those blinds are only this tall to start with. So if you can get them that much lower, that's even better. You know, I have seen guys uh, in Washington especially, everything's green. They hunt all green fields up there. It's, it's rare that they hunt corn. There's not much corn up there, but... It, the geese just don't hit the corn like they do the green field. It's unbelievable up there. Uh, Colorado's kind of the same thing. Sod farms, oh, they tear them up. The farmers beg you to shoot them. The sod farmers just, they hate them. You know, they'll have the geese in the field all day long, every day. And they're just constantly calling those guys to come out here and shoot these geese. But that's a hard situation. It's hard to hide. Um, 
and some of them have actually let them put pits in in those sod farms and uh, one of the most amazing things I've seen the guy was is in a sod farm and uh, you know he put like a three or four man pit in it and it's level I mean it's level with the ground like this and the lids actually fold in and he's got grass growing on top of those lids so it's just flat out there and you know he just kind of peeks out and and most of the time when they're doing that they're downwinding those geese though they're not shooting them coming in this way the wind is is coming from this direction and the birds are flying over their head and they're waiting for them just about to hit the ground and, and as they go over them they start lowering their lids wait for one goose just to start setting his feet down and they'll shoot the highest goose and when they do that the geese flare and they blow straight back over the top of them so they're shooting them just like this coming straight at them if you can set up like that if you've got a chance and you've got some way to hide it's over I mean uh, we've got some pro staff up in Washington that have a guide service and they do that all the time on those lesser those lesser geese and cacklers they'll have you know four or five hunters in there they're guiding and they may kill 12 14 birds out of a group doing that just because those lessers are a little different when they get up they kind of come up in a funnel they don't just individually come up they group together and go up so they basically cut the group in half they shoot right in the middle every hunter will shoot right in the middle of that group at one time and then they have a flock high and a flock low because they've cut the middle out so it's it's different situations we were talking about this earlier uh, the decoys have gotten better and better uh, we actually have what's called a fully flocked this year you know these have the flocked heads we've actually got some this year the whole body of the decoys flocked and that flocking does make a difference there's two situations it makes a difference one heavy frost that will be the first thing that clears if you have decoys set out overnight that's the first thing that clears off because that flocking will hold heat and will absorb heat faster than just the regular plastic will so that would be the first thing to clear off heavy snow it would be the last thing for snow to cover because it does have heat in it and it will absorb it so you may get an extra it may not make a huge difference you might get an hour extra hunting before you have to start clearing decoys off yeah that can that can mean the difference in killing three or killing fifteen uh, if it's just dust if it's real dust, dusty dry wind take uh, an air hose air compressor blow it off uh, if it's mud let the mud dry and either take a hose and spray it off or after it's dried take some kind of soft bristle brush and brush it off some of these today Dustin had in his bag we just had to pull them out and we just did like this and just wiped them off but um, we make a product called a six slot decoy bag best thing for taking care of these decoys uh, especially the fully flocks because each decoy has its own slot they're separated they don't rub together you know everybody asks me how the flocking stands up it's great but you can't just use it like you you can't abuse those decoys like everybody has for years take them out of the field and just grab them by the head and throw them in the trailer you know you're getting these decoys at a good price but that doesn't mean you don't need to take care of them you know that's the that's the biggest complaint I hear well the flocking didn't hold up well how do you transport them well I just throw them in the trailer every day nothing will hold up like that if if uh, you just take a little bit of care of these decoys the flock you won't have a single problem out of flocking you know you what you do have to watch is let's say you put these in one of these bags I try to always put mine in the bag to where the heads are facing out all the way around you you got three this way and the heads are sticking out this way and sticking out the other side because you will have problems if you have them like this and it's and it's just rubbing 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 you'll get shiny spots on it but just take a little bit of care of the decoys and they'll last you a long time. Yes. 
Yeah, yeah and, and actually, you can leave it. Yeah. Put them in there like there that. You know, yeah. But you know, there's when I was getting to, we talked about this uh, before this all started. I was telling him when uh, I grew up on the Mississippi Flyway, hunted real high pressure area, real foot lake, you know, uh, 89 I started hunting there. We had everything you can imagine in the spread because you had to. You had to have huge numbers there, a lot of pressure, a lot of birds. We had tires cut in half, turned inside out with a hole with a slit in them, had wooden heads in them. We had five gallon buckets cut in half, wooden heads stuck in them. Had silhouettes, had full bodies, had floaters. You know, we were hunting over spread of 6,000, between six and 7,000 decoys. We had cotton trailers full of decoys. But you had to do that because your pit was here with between six and 7,000. 500 yards over here, there's another pit with six or 7,000. 500 yards over here, there's another pit, and it just went on. I mean, it was just, everybody had that kind of spread because of just the, the numbers that were there, you had to have them to, for drawing power. And we used to call it the black hole. That's what they were looking for. Especially, we were killing all those geese when it was extremely cold. I mean, stretches of below zero for a week to 10 days or two weeks below zero. So there's no open water anywhere. You're hunting ice and snow. So, like I said earlier, those geese get real tight when it gets when it gets uh, cold. So you're looking for that big black. The geese are looking for that big black wad down there. Uh, and another thing, uh, days like this. This is just an example of of scouting and that kind of thing to go back to where we started. Crystal clear days like this, when it's real real cold. Geese can sit out in the sun. You can tell the difference out here in the sun as opposed to up in front where it's in the shade. Clear days when it's real cold, most of the time the geese will sit all day, go out right before dark and feed. They get body heat up by flying, and when they get that grain in their crawl, they produce heat, body heat. So the geese will usually just feed once a day when it's you know bright and sunny and clear, but extremely cold. You start getting in times of dark skies, snow. You'll see geese moving a lot more because they're not getting that sun keeping them warm. So they've got to go out and feed and they've got to go out and fly to get the body temperature up. And then they go back and sit and they sit real close to try to hold that heat. So that's just another tip of watching geese when it's, when, you know, as far as weather, when they're feeding, how many times a day they're feeding. So. There's all kinds of little small things like that that help you. You just, you've got to watch them. I mean, you really do. Uh, you know, just like this, I'm sure most of you have probably seen feeding geese and two or three or four or a dozen in the back walking, trying to catch up. Or they may even be flying to catch up, you know, hopping over. That's just, just little things like that that add a little realism. So, and feeders, relaxed. You want relaxed, relaxed, relaxed. Uh, I've got four dozen fully flocked Canada decoys coming. Out of four dozen, I've got three dozen feeders, a dozen actives. So, I'm looking for a relaxed situation. Same thing with specs. I've got a dozen and a half feeders and a dozen actives. Full body mallards, a dozen and a half feeders, a dozen actives. And it, you just want it just as, as relaxed as you can get. Because if you've got a lot of heads up, that's alert. Those geese are looking. Anybody have any questions about anything else? Anything? Come on, you gotta have some questions. You have floaters too in the specs. How about waters? Uh, no floaters. No, yeah, we do have floaters in the specs. There's a few still out. Um, 
Water situations, that's one thing I can kind of go over. A little different. Um, you still want it relaxed. It kind of goes more into calling uh, on water more than anything. Um, when you get on water, you've probably been out hunting, especially in some of these uh, refuges and public areas. Still days, calm days, you can hear somebody 300 yards over there talking because that sound just travels across that water. If you're in the, in the blind and you're hunting water and the geese start flying, very, you very, need very little calling because they can hear everything if it's calm. Very little. Um, windy days, yeah, you've got to call more. And that's no wind days, you can get by. You want a low tone call, low pitch, because that won't carry as far and it's not as loud. High wind, uh, you, you need a higher pitch call. That higher pitch will travel farther than that low. That's the reason, uh, first, one of the first short reeds that I blew was a half breed. That call still kills geese today for that one fact. The call's got the right pitch and the right volume. Uh, it's probably... Right into where I was going next, man. Would you guys mind giving these guys uh, maybe a half a routine? First, explain what you're doing as far as the call goes. It's so rare you get a chance to hear it out here. That's one of the things that I'm trying to yeah. generate some kind of excitement about the call and everything. Because it's leaving. The call is disappearing. And these two guys are awesome. This guy's a 2005 state. Um, They've both been doing it for a long time, and they're really good. Contest calling is a whole lot different. I'm talking field meat. Okay. All right. Um, but you still got to use your routine somewhat because you got to explain to these guys. Yeah. What what, do. what we'll do is uh, just kind of start out. You want to sound like a flock of geese is what you're trying to do. Whether it's one person, two people, three people. If you get three people calling. It's, it's, yeah. But if you've got one good caller or two good callers and one guy that can just cluck, just have him cluck or just have him do a moan. Because you'll always have one goose in the flock. I don't care if you see, if you saw geese fly over right now, you'd always have one goose in there just going, bah! Bah! you'll always have that one. You'll hear clucks. Bah! You'll always hear that. And and I kind of went over this earlier in, in the calling seminar I did. To kill geese, clucks and moans, that's it. You don't need all the fancy stuff from contest calling. Cluck and moan. That's it. Just bloop, bloop. That's it. That's all you've got to have to kill geese. Day in and day out. Now there's times heavy pressure. There's, there's times heavy pressure. Trafficking birds, if you're not on what we call the X, um, you do need more calling. You do need a bigger spread. But just day in and day out, just your usual spot, you know, clucks and moans is the best way to, to do it. And we can kind of go through um, just a situation, let's say we see the geese and we're just going to try to, you just want to start, you want to take their temperature to start with. Uh, you don't want to just, you don't want to start that right off the bat. Just see what they're going to do. You know, flag them. Start with a little flagging. Just, just see if you can catch their attention. And then when they get to 150, 200 yards, then you might just, you know, honk at them. Little cluck. Uh, I like to use a spit note with a little moan on it, um, just to kind of get their attention, and just see what they're going to do. And then you might, as they get closer, we call it pitching at the decoys. You see geese get out of formation and start falling in like this, and you know you'll see them start gliding. Watch their wing beats. It 
that'll determine how much you need to call. If those geese never miss a beat and just keep going, don't waste your time. They've got something in mind already. But you see them and they start breaking out of formation, start sliding. Then you've got a chance at those birds. So we'll kind of just cluck. Start off slow and work up. Yeah. And uh, just listen for me slowing down. You know, that's, and you know there wasn't there, there wasn't a lot of fancy stuff there. It was just clucks and moans and some honks. And then I did a little bit of that that uh, spit note and that moan that. You know, um, there's certain calls that really, you know, pull their heads, and that's one of them. You're not going to get that kind of response out of, you're not going to get that head turning response. That spit note and hard clucks, sometimes you hit them at the right time and you just see, and they never move. Watch what the geese are doing. If you find a certain note and you see those geese break down, stay with that because that's what got their attention to start with. You know, if you're doing fast clucks and those geese really break down, stay on it till they get a little closer. Keep them interested. You know, there's, there's a ton of tricks. Um, and it just comes with experience of hunting them. It's, you know, just like ducks. You know, you've hunted a bunch of ducks. That little whining call will break their necks a lot of times. Just, you know, and just hard. And it's all when you call. We kind of talked about that earlier, too. When you call, you have to watch that. But, you know, specs, I like hunting them. It's, uh, they're really vocal, decoy well. If, you know, it all depends on location. Best thing, location, location, and location. That's your top three things you look for. If you're not there, it's hard to get them. If you're not where they want to be, it's hard to get them there. Basement. Uh